Alrighty, it's the appropriate time. Everyone's here, so I'll call call the meeting to order. And uh, I think it's, it is not on the agenda, but it's always been our policy to accept public comment before we get started. Um, and, and the one piece of comment I might suggest, we did receive communication um, from the tenants group. And I don't know whether anybody from the tenants group wants to because we're being recorded both audio and video in minutes, and I have to announce that as well. If somebody from the tenants group wants to read this, do you want to come sure. up now and read it sure. so that it's included in the video? Um, it's part it's part of our record, but you might want it on the video as well for anybody. So just give us your name and address, and, and if you want to put this on the record by reading it. That sure. My name is Emily Fox. I currently live in Holyoke, Massachusetts. Do you need my street address, or I don't know how no. this goes. No, that's okay. But I was for many years a long time Northampton resident. Um, this is addressed to Mayor David Narkowitz, the members of the Northampton City Council, and the members of the Florence Community Center Reuse Committee. We, the Tenants Association of the Florence Community Center, are writing to strongly urge you to give your highest attention and consideration to requests for proposals, RFPs, for the Florence Community Center that feature a multi-use scenario wherein the arts organizations and small businesses that currently occupy the center are allowed to continue their residence in the building, enabling them to continue to serve the thousands of people from Brattleboro to Boston, from Hartford to the Berkshires, who already pass through these doors on a weekly basis. The Florence Community Center is a remarkable conglomeration of artists, performers, movement therapists, a radio station, Habitat for Humanity, Casa Latina, and many other small businesses who are uniting to create a new vision for the center. The arts are a proven economic stimulus for any community, and we stand ready to apply our significant talents and resources in helping the building thrive as a much-needed arts and community center in Florence. As residents of Northampton continue to spread west into Florence to live, we see FCC as the perfect site for developing a hub for the arts and community in this, quote, western front of Northampton. Especially as we see arts and community spaces in Northampton continue to disappear, we feel strongly that FCC offers an important opportunity to preserve and enhance the vibrant culture cli cultural climate of Northampton. The Florence Community Center Tenants Association is prepared to help any prospective buyer of the building who supports these goals. Some ways that we have already begun to support this effort, reaching out to individuals and organizations that might be interested and in a position to donate the financial and or organizational resources to the project. Outreach to other artists and community groups that could fill the empty rental spaces bringing the building to full occupancy. Organizing a tenants association to work more efficiently and effectively to support this effort in a variety of ways. Thank you for your attention. We are excited by the prospect of transforming the Florence Community Center into a vital and vibrant center for arts. Many of the pieces are already in place for the right new building owner, and we will work hard to make this a reality. There are no other spaces like FCC in our area, and with increased marketing of the space combined with the ample parking, we are certain that many more artists and community members will be drawn to use the building and then patronize local businesses. In closing, please consider in your decision-making process giving preference to those prospective buyers who will support and encourage our vision of making the Florence Community Center even more of a destination for arts and small businesses than it is at present. We are galvanizing support for this use of the building throughout the community and hope that you will join us in making the Florence Community Center the astonishing center for the arts and small businesses that it is capable of becoming. All citizens of Northampton will benefit from this action. Thank you. And this is signed by all the tenants, which includes probably, I would say all told, maybe 20 or 30 people who are members um, of the various organizations. Thank you very much. Thank you. Is, is there anybody else that has specific public comment in addition to the reading of the statement from the tenants? Anyone? All right. Hearing none, we'll move along with our agenda. Uh, the next item would be approval of minutes from November 
27, 2012, and January 22, 2013. Okay. Any discussion on this? All in favor? Aye. Okay. Um, and then our main, main item for tonight is discussion um, and revision, just basically start working on a draft or request for proposals for the building. And uh, that, a request for proposal is assuming that this group is going to make a recommendation to the city council to surplus the building. If we don't intend on surplusing it and selling it, we don't really need an RFP for someone to use as a guideline to bid on the building. Um, unfortunately, taking that vote is not on our agenda for this evening, which probably makes it inappropriate to do that, because theoretically we want to take the vote that yes, we're going to recommend a surplus and sale of the building, and then go to work on the RFP that would be used for that sale. But since it isn't on the agenda, uh, I feel kind of uncomfortable actually asking for a vote on it tonight. Uh, but we do have everyone in place to start to work on the RFP. So by the act of doing that, we're, we're sort of agreeing that uh, at our next meeting, we're probably going to take that vote so that we officially put on notice that we are going to take the step to develop the RFP and to sell the building. So um, we're kind of doing a little out of order because our minutes don't reflect that vote tonight, but we'll move forward with the discussion of the RFP because that is on the agenda, and we'll specifically put it on the agenda the next time so we don't uh, upset the open meeting gods and, 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 and do something inappropriate. Um, so what I might do at this point, we have a form request for proposal, and uh, we got this with the help of uh, purchasing agent and attorney Joe Cook, who is in the room tonight. So would you mind stepping to the podium and, and walking us through the different components of this so we know what, what the base document is and where we fill in the blanks? If, if you put it that way. Hello, everybody. The honor members of the ad hoc and counselors. And um, this is uh, to start off uh, with what has to go into an RFP. This is uh, Chapter 30B, Section 16, uh, the relevant sections that apply to what we're doing here today. You can see it's very brief. Um, an RFP for the sale of land under 30B is much easier than an RFP for goods and services. It's, it's, uh, it leaves a lot up to our judgment. So that makes it easy, but it also puts a lot about on, uh, on you guys about what you want to see for the future use of the, of the property. Um, this section of the law describes how we advertise. I'll take care of that. Um, but what you have to decide basically is what restrictions you want to put on the use of the property in the future. Uh, that will have to go to council for council's approval also, but I'm sure it'll give due weight to this uh, committee's recommendations. Um, that is going to be the main part of this RFP. The rest of it is a purchase and sale agreement, which is very standard. Um, we will have the city's legal counsel look through that, make sure that's up to date. Uh, what's in there right now is probably 10 or 15 years old, and I'd, I'd like to have that the city solicitor just make sure there isn't any new legal requirements. But the, the meat of the matter is what restrictions are you going to be putting on the building, and what do you want to see in the way of a developer um, because you can look at the qualifications of the developer if you want. Um, we will be, the main thrust of the RFP is maintaining a, a, a level playing field. Everybody's going to be bidding on the same property. Um, you can't say that you're going to be interested in historical preservation and small business incubation and then award it to somebody who proposes uh, an aerospace manufacturing facility. Um, if you don't put it in the RFP, you can't look at it when you make an award. So that, uh, that maintains a level playing field. Everybody is having a fair chance to submit their best proposal on the property. Um, the decision will be made by this group, I assume, the award, is, or Finance if uh, may, by itself. I think, I think what would happen, well, the way it's worked in the past, is generally there's a surplus. Mm -hmm. The council would surplus it and, and authorize the issuance of an RFP, and then I think then 
probably the mayor in consultation with the property committee would then mm -hmm. issue the do it carry out the administrative procedure. Right. Usually the surplusing order says which group or exactly. person would yeah. carry out the exactly. that order. Yeah. Um, does anybody have any questions to this point about council? Yeah, this, it's not a historic register, so it, there is no any historical preservation restriction that we put on there. We put on there willingly. We're not forced to. Is that correct? Uh, well, there is. There was a, a site plan approval granted by the planning board last year. Part of that approval was uh, recording a historic preservation restriction. That hasn't happened yet. It's still in process. Um, if we wanted to not do that, then the site plan approval we got would not be effective. We could go back to the planning board and see if they would issue that same approval without the restriction. Or we could decide we don't need the uses that were granted with that restriction. Could I just, as a point of information, because the reason why, and actually the Central Services Department went before the planning board, you may remember um, we passed that ordinance uh, last year uh, that dealt with historic churches, schools. You may also remember we got sued by the Friends of St. Mary's about it. Um, but, um, but, and so because we had uses in the building that were not in compliance, um, and so we ended up uh, then Mr. Pomerantz went before the planning board to get a special a site plan, I guess, in order to bring all those uses into compliance. Um, and, and the planning board put as a condition of that site plan that we file a, this historic preservation. Now there is a question about whether that's required or not, or whether we could ask the planning board to not require it, so that is a possibility. But you remember sort of the the policy argument for it was that right now um, you're not allowed to do residential in the central business district downtown. Mm -hmm. But if someone came forward and said, I can preserve this historic church, but I can only do it if you let me do residential, that ordinance allowed the planning board to grant them that, gave them the discretion to allow to allow that in an effort to try to keep the building preserved. But as a, the catch was, you had to give this re restriction saying, I am indeed going to not tear the church down. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to preserve it. So it was in that context that the city had to go forward to say, we are now, we want to be able to allow, because there's some uses in there, the, the classes, the lessons, um, some things like that that didn't comply with um, the OI zoning, the underlying OI zoning. Um, but because it's a a former school or former church building, we were allowed to go to request this special or site plan to allow those uses to continue. So, there, so there would, depending on how we write the RFP, there would be nothing that would restrict us from from eliminating. Uh, that is that, and that is a question because again, we haven't filed the historic, so we could certainly the city could right now give back the um, the site plan review. We could. You know, give that up, relinquish that, um, and say we don't want it anymore. Of course, that would then trigger the fact that several of the current uses in the building would no longer would be out of compliance with zoning. Um, but certainly, you could do that and then leave it to a future buyer to decide what kinds of restrictions they want to put on the building or what kind of zoning they what what they want to do in the building. I'm not advocating for tearing the building down. I'm just no, 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 no. Uh, yeah, such as our, our Lily Library in Lawrence. Yeah. Put that addition on was pretty labor intensive before it even got to the first nail. Um, so I'm just I'm just curious that somebody could purchase the building and put an addition on it because according to what is written in the back here, this preservation it seems almost impossible. Well, yeah, there is a that and and you're correct that a as part of the RFP a draft of what the historic preservation restriction that would carry with the building if. If we sold it, that, that's what the meat of this is in there. But that is still an open question. That could certainly be abandoned, and we could just uh, RFP it as is. Um, or, go, or as you had suggested, potentially go back to the planning board to try to amend the site plan for it and, and seek it without, the, without, the, um, without that requirement. Okay. Thank you. Let me see if I got this right. With, with the historic preservation, the non-conforming uses, the pre-existing non-conforming uses can continue. 
without the uh, historic distinction that those are no longer in compliance and that in potential jeopardy, but can are subject to appeal. Is that right? Might right. We could go and try and get the approval without the historic restriction. Right. Okay. Which would require any potential developer going before the planning board and making the case that the existing tenants are not a burdensome issue for the neighborhood. Right. Or they could individually go for their own uses. That would have been required before. The tenants yeah. would have been required to individually go, we got a, a, right. a so broad, building-wide permission. And the historic and the historic preservation essentially is, is uh, preserving the envelope and the, and the, and the, and the silhouette. Go ahead. Well, with all of this, the OI zone zoning still remains in force. Yes, yes. we've rezoned it. This does not change any zoning. You're right. Okay, no, that's and, important. And a lot of the support for the zoning change that permitted the reuse of educational and, and religious buildings was that many times those buildings are in residential zones where nothing of this nature conforms. You know, I think the Clark School for the Deaf, the entire campus is zoned residential, so that they couldn't do any kind of business, anything up there, unless it was educational or religious, with that exemption. This is a little different in that this is already, I mean, this is in a new zone that we created, Office Industrial, which does permit a lot more of those uses. So it may well be that a potential developer could look at it and say, I'd rather, I think I can do what we need to do with the underlying zoning alone without the special permit. Uh, or they may say, gee, I'd rather do the special permit, you know, I, I want to get to the same place, which channel do I want to go down? And, and perhaps that's something that we should leave, leave to the bidders to determine, do you want it or don't you want it? Can you do what you want to do with it or without it? And, and see where... What, what the bidders feel like, rather than saying you must take this course or that course. Um, I'd be interested just polling the committee. How many people are profoundly interested in the historic architectural value of that building versus how many are concerned with what its, what its reuse is and what functions go on in there? Because we never really talked about, at this point, anybody feeling that the uh, that the school was some architect, unique architectural gem that needed to be preserved in perpetuity. I, it I sounds like a loaded question. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, well, it just never come up before. Our discussions have always revolved around maintaining the incubator uses, and, and this is the first time that, that the historic preservation of the structure and preserving that has ever come to the table, because no one had ever mentioned it. So, I guess I just want to provoke discussion as to who feels strongly about what the building looks like. I'll jump in. Um, I spoke early on about the building's relationship to that sort of entry point of the outlying town coming into Florence, coming into North Hampton through Florence. That's a pretty great piece of uh, public architecture. You know, it's clear it was a school in that era. And I hate to throw the baby out in the bathwater and just know that there's maybe a particular component of historic preservation that would restrict some uses with the risk that it could be completely distinct. I think I feel like it does have a relationship to a part of town that is and always was pedestrian. Kids walk to school and there's that sense of neighborhood you get there that seeing that site that looks like an old school, I'd love it to continue to look like an old school. I think that's something, especially across from the Sojourner Truth and next to a church. We have some alumni here. No. <laughs> Chime in. <laughs> um, I would hate to drive down uh, Pine Street and see the building gone. I've been looking at it for 57 years. And, um, but I, some of the things like the windows and things such as that and the doors and that structure <laughs> are, I want to say, so inefficient or ineffective or such a disaster or it's not cost effective to try and make that the windows and, but the actual structure I agree with it. I think it's a um, but there's some components that 
in some of these uh, res uh, restrictions, these preservation restrictions that don't even allow you to change what a window looks like. I mean, they have put tape on uh, windows on Elm Street to make the grill look like it did. You know, things like that. So um, I think there's some there's some leniency here or something that, that should happen. Um, well, if the feeling is is one of, you know, I hate to see the total building gone, but perhaps the level of restriction that we could all we could always put in uh, prohibit the demolition of the structure because uh, we do have a demolition delay, though it, it's it, it's a year in many parts of the community, but. In the Elm Street District and in the Central Business District, it can be permanent. If those bodies don't allow it, it never happens. And perhaps that would be a means of an end is just to say you can't demolish the building, but if you want to change the windows, you don't have to go to a, you know, a, a historic commission meeting to get people to pick what kind of windows you put in, but you can't, in general, demolish. You can demolish a building entirely, but you wouldn't have to go you know, piecemeal for many of the restrictions involved. With historic preservation, I, I would think, and then I'll see to Rich, that the, the, the um, that as I described, the envelope and the silhouette are more to what Maureen's speaking to. That 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 this not suddenly look like a Pizza Hut or do, do some, you know, a lot of trademark kind of structures that are looking like that, and less so for um, window treatments. I mean, clearly. Know, the, and, and more very, I mean, there's there's minutia in the downtown historic commission that that I think is a, a much tighter threshold than the, the Nantucket standard, as it were, <coughs> that wouldn't be appropriate to apply to this system. So that, that essentially the that the structure represents exactly what the structure is, as Maureen stated, which is is it's a gateway property that looks like a school institutional building that, uh, and, and based on some of the stuff that we've already discussed about what the RFP would be composed of, it would be, it should reflect that and it's appropriate to reflect that, and I don't know. So I would, I, I, if it came to the sort of restrictions and limitations, I would give wide berth, personally, to be my recommendation. Yeah, I, I agree with what's been said, is that I'd like to maintain it, and I think that you know, it's important to note that you know, the windows and those sorts of things, I don't want to put restrictions on it. I don't know how uh, how to phrase it, you know, I mean, to just say you can do whatever you want, but you can't demolish the building. Well, I don't want somebody to, to vinyl cite it. But, you know, so so somehow there's got to be a, a line drawn to, you know, we want to maintain the general appearance of the building, and so, you know, it has this you know, historic significance of, of that era of municipal building. Um, but, you know, you can, you know, make it efficient and make it useful. Can I just ask you, from the what's in here now, what is it, what is this proposed restriction talk about with regard to windows? What, what do you, what are the restrictions that it places? I don't know. Okay. This, uh, Wayne Fyden provided this, uh, yesterday, I think. Yeah. Or two days ago. Yeah. I've not read the details. Okay. Yeah. And, and some... Some of my concern comes from having served on both the Elm Street Historic District and the Downtown Architectural District, and the fact that we, I think, can foresee that we have, we're going to have some not-for-profits bid on this. And some of those issues can raise the cost of doing what seem to be simple things tremendously. So I, I certainly, since we hadn't talked about it before, wanted to get a feel for how people felt about it. You know, how high do we set the bar? Because the higher you set the bar, the more expensive it can be to maintain the building. And if our concern is more one of use, then maybe we want to be reasonable in what we require the new owners of the building to do as far as historic issues. Uh, so they can concentrate on the integrity and the efficiency of the building so that if the main interest is in the uses, we don't hamstring them too much with envelope stuff. Yeah, uh, what Wayne has here is uh, major for windows and doors of the wholesale replacement of units, change in uh, fenestration or materials, alteration of profile or setback of windows, the addition of storm windows is also considered a major change. Power with notifications coming in. So I, I, I actually think, personally, I think that's too restrictive given the circumstances. I think one of the, one of the bigger issues, of course, in the space is the, uh, the 
public space, the larger the stage space, the all-purpose room, as it were, which is uh, all glass windows and the major uh, you know, energy system. And that, uh, I would imagine any developer who is interested in maintaining a facility that's affordable, that that would be one of the things that will be <coughs> And, and um, to have to jump through significant hoops and consequently probably increase the potential costs associated with retrofitting this, I don't want to, I don't want to put a limitation there. So then, and, and just to draw some consensus, it seems like people are concerned that the, that the character of the, the building not be demolished and that reasonable care is taken to preserve its general appearance, but perhaps not so much that it hamstrings uh, a future owner of the building uh, in, in what it takes to maintain it so that they can spend more time on the energy efficiency and, and, and making the uses that you want to see in the building feasible versus spending all of their resources just historically maintaining the facade of the building. Is that a fair? That's fair. Well, what, where this conversation is going? So that, um, and, and most, most of this RFP agreement is the uh, preservation restriction part of, part of it, if you look through it, um, that perhaps that, that needs a, a, little, a little tweaking before we actually deal with that again. And since I think most people are here for the discussion of, of potential uses, maybe we focus on the use part tonight and go through this document and see if we can extract the parts of it that seem reasonable to everybody to want to move forward with, rather than spending a lot of time on that tonight. And uh, so we don't want to keep Mr. Cook standing here at the podium longer than we do. <laughs> Does anybody have any questions for Joe immediately, or can he sit down for a minute and we'll call him if we need him? I do have another one, just um, relative to, to an RFP. You said earlier that um, you know, it needs to be a level playing field, that you can't consider something from one bidder that is not in the RFP. I assume what you mean is that you can't restrict somebody or add a restriction later on. But if some if if we put on RFP that looks something like this and one of the, the bidders comes through and says, I'm gonna do all of this and I'm also gonna put a community garden on the roof. We say, Oh, we like that a lot, so we'll go with you. That's okay. No. Oh it isn't no. you your only out at that point would be to reject all proposals and add that as something you're looking for and then you can go out to bid again. You know, if hopefully during our uh, development of the RFP, we will will have a meeting with uh, proposers, and they can give us ideas of things they'd like to see. You know, the building used for, and we can all have that conversation and say, "All right, let's add um, aerospace manufacturing as to something that we'd like to see there," and then everybody has a chance to bid on that and have that be an, an attractive part of their proposal. But adding some feature that is not in no way related to artistic use or small business incubation is not, it, we just wouldn't be able to look at it. So, so Joe, any other modifications would require specificity in the strategy? Right. Or a commission on a broader um, set of criteria that would encompass that? That's a good question. Right, if you, if you made your, didn't limit it to small business and uh, artistic uses, uh, you, if you said community, uh, uses and a garden is a community use, then then that would encompass that. But that would also compel you to consider bids that you might find unattractive. Right. So can I ask you a question? I thought there was a, there were a couple of areas, Joe, where you had some sort of open-ended qu some questions or, or that um, maybe I saw an earlier draft. That oh, uh, that the first page under item one. Uh, yeah. So, um, what uses do we want to preserve? Yeah, so and that, that's how like, long? Because there's a 30 year limit on restrictions on use. Um, so, do you want to say 10 years? We want small business incubator, or do we want it the full 30? The longer the period, the, the less money we're going to get. So, that's even if you want to do that. Like, if, that, if that's the option you want, then you'd have to try to spell that out there. Right. Uh, I.e., like the Prospect Street, we said we wanted a food bank. You know, we wanted some some, uh, some organization that serves food to the needy. And, yeah. and so, so you we can, yeah, you you can, can start something on that. Craft the RFP 
really specifically, but then you can't consider that's right. uses that don't impact material. I mean, you kind of box yourself. Right. You're making your bitter pool smaller and smaller until there's only one or two. Like with the survival center lease bid, we, we knew who we were going to get a, a, a proposal from. And we got exactly what we wanted, and everybody was happy. In a nutshell, number 16, runs it with the land. I think I've read that about a dozen times. And every time I get to the end of it, it's, um, I seem to think it says something different. Oh, you're in the preservation agreement. Yeah. yeah you're in the preservation oh, okay. <coughs> that one goes forever. Forever. Okay. Thank you. And, and, that, but that's the... Not, not what goes inside, but not the use, but the physical envelope. Right. Uh, and the pilot would also be in perpetuity, the uh, payment in lieu of taxes, which is something you also have to decide whether you want that in or not. I put it in because previous councils in the last couple of sales had wanted a, a payment in lieu of taxes clause. Could you describe how the, the pilot works? Uh, if the buyer or any subsequent buyers are non taxable, tax exempt like an educational use, uh, the building would be taxed as if they were taxable. So looking assessed in the normal manner, billed in the same manner. But it wouldn't be a tax, it would be a payment in lieu of tax. And that tax is, that pilot is attached to the tax rate. And for all practical intents and purposes, would manifest as a tax of sorts. So yes, it would be equivalent to a tax. I don't know if it would affect, go into our tax rate. Um, I mean, is it assessed on a regular basis? It, 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 it is, and it's a side agreement that you would sign. Right. I don't think it would be part of our tax base. Yeah. Right. It would be quarterly. I put in that it was, you know, due at the same time as quarterly taxes. But yeah, I'm personally interested in, in how it's assessed and, and, and what that rate would be. So that it would, it's commensurate with, with the tax rate you'd be paying to keep your for profit. Right. You know, if you change the name of the business to something Inc. and it's not a nonprofit, right. What would the tax be? And it, yes, it would be, they'd still assess the building and compute what the taxes would be to figure the pilot. Right, exactly. Which would be tax revenue because it is. Right, it's, a, it's like a lease payment. Right. Okay. So it would, it would not be part of the no. no, it would not. No, it wouldn't. We, yeah, have a we have a pilot on the yeah. on the Solomon Schechter School yeah. because we sold a city parcel to them for the construction of that. We required a pilot, um, so we have a pilot agreement that's paid in lieu of tax. So it's income, but it's not yeah in the levy computation. And that is exhausted. For instance, on resale, if it went to a for-profit system, the the pilot is no longer attached to the property. Yeah. Well, what happens if they in turn sell it back to a nonprofit? So we get to it runs with the. The land. It okay, so any time a five part of the D service yeah. agency is in there uh, as a principal owner that they the pilot kicks back in. Kicks back in. Okay. Oh, great. Thank you. All right, so Joe, for instance, say you do have a couple of contractors who are very interested in purchasing that property. There would be an amount that they would have to give down, correct? Right, the, the what top. would that percentage be? Uh, I believe I put in 5%. I'm not sure. 5% of your proposal price. Okay, what would happen if they didn't sign the agreement? If they were selected as the most favorable proposal and they refused to sign the agreement, that would become our property. That would be the what? Our, it would become the city's property. Okay. Or property. Their property, right? Right. Okay. Right. It would be to make up for our lost time, money, and doing the RFP and having to do it over again. Any other questions for Mr. Proposal? Yeah, this may be a question now, or it might just be as we work this through, it will become clearer to me, but I'm comparing the, just the structure of, of page two of the um, request for proposal with chapter 30B of whatever that is. Um, which describes what should be the components of this, and I'm really interested in um, the 
identification of evaluation criteria that we're going to set and rule for award, where would that fall within here, where we want to establish kind of how we evaluate what we set as our criteria? Um, that would go right there on the instructions to proposal um, page. We could add um, our rule for award is the best price offered by the proposer who uh, best addresses the following criteria. Mm -hmm. It's very loosey-goosey in a real estate RFP. So you could just list a historic preservation, a small, base, uh, small business incubation, artistic uses, garden on the roof, and then you don't have to assign points. You don't have to put them in order of importance. Um, so you just define all the factors you want to look at. Then you are locked into those factors. But there's, there's no hierarchy. You don't have to give percentages or points or letter grades. It's the committee would make it, uh, look at all the proposals and come up with their, their best judgment on which is the best proposal. OK, so that's ours to draft. And that would fall into that instructions Right, just historic, you know, very brief, mm -hmm. you know, uh, community, economic development, whatever you want to put in there, but it's got to be comprehensive. It'll be the only things you can look at. And then price, of course. And then um, when they, when we get responses, are they, do we request them to be in the form of, because uh, it looks like right now all we're asking for them to say, yeah, they will preserve the use of whatever we determine and they give us a price. But I would expect we would get something that was in a little bit more fleshed out form, like their proposal. How they're right, their proposal space. would, we would request them to address the whatever uh, uses you have set up there, or you know things that you're going to be looking at. So address historical preservation, address uh, economic development, address artistic uses, and then we give you a narrative proposal for that. Then the bid form would just be the price. Good, thanks. Um, last question: Is it in our task? to also um, confirm that, that they are uh, financially, they have the resources to maintain the building upon purchase? You don't have to look at that. Since this is a sale, you know, we get the money, we run away. Uh, if you want to look at the qualifications of the developer, you may. You can uh, look at experience with some of the projects if you'd like, uh, ask for evidence of financial backing, you know, to a letter from the bank saying yes, they can get up to you know, $1.2 million for a construction loan. There are a number of ways to do that, if you want to do that. But then, that's criteria you have to take into consideration. So a small startup nonprofit would have a disadvantage in comparison to some entity that could come out of the woodwork with deeper pockets. Right, you would be limiting your bidder pool again. And you might want to do that, but it, it will be in effect. Yeah, another the party established the pilot is not part of the levy, so the, the money goes to the general fund, and then we have, is that an exemption or an abatement? I mean, is there, will that, the overlay account will have, there's not, will they're not, they're not, they're not part of the levy because they're not, a, they're, be they're not a taxable profit, they're not yeah. a taxable property, so there wouldn't be any need to offset that okay. because they're not even on the tax roll, they're not part of the levy. It just flows to the general fund. Okay. It's just a general revenue. When we get a pilot, you know, we get a pilot from the housing authority. We get we get a pilot, small pilot from Smith. We get, and they just yeah, they flow in as revenue. We get some James House too. No, we own that. We own that. Yeah. We get the rent. Yeah, and something small from the state. $50. They're always thinking of So any other questions for uh, Mr. Cook while we have him here? So could I ask your advice in terms of should we, should the committee then like try to brainstorm or think about what that list of things we want we want to look like or is that should that be? I mean, that's sort of like the missing piece here. If you wanted to be, but could you not have so many? Could you leave it more general and and um, not be as specific to to allow for a broader potential, you know, of proposals? Uh, yes, you could 
just restrict the, just state the restrictions you want if you want to put any restrictions on you could say it must be used for small business incubation and artistic uses and not give them any chance to describe how they're going to do that and um, uh, not compare one against the other as long as all the proposals meet that minimum standard of but do you even have to specify an end use, or could you specify something more general, like it fits in with the character of you know, the surrounding area or village of Florence, or you know, could it be more general than that? Or, do you, or should you really say these are the uses? We have to have a rule for a word okay. in order to maintain the level Because I mean, the there are uses allowed field. by right. I mean, there are uses are allowed by right under the zoning. Right. It, the so, you know the subtext is everything they is going to have to comply with zoning or with zoning permissions obtained through site plan approval or special permit. So they have to comply with zoning. Um, beyond that, if you want anything more than complying with zoning, we should def define that. At least... I mean, I want to say the, one of the ironies of the appraiser's report was he said that probably the best use would be our, uh, live, work, art space, um, which doesn't conform to the zoning. But if you got a special permit, you could, you could do that. So, um, but so it's one of the questions of in that case, it would add value to the property if we were selling it with that already in place. But, but other users may see a restriction as devaluing the property by limiting the uses. Uh, a live work assignment would actually change. I think would have an impact on at least the disposition that we've been discussing. Yeah, on some on some level. Yeah. People wanted to work performance space, clearly living in that a sure. performance yeah. space would have its own yeah. associated challenges and all that. So would it um, because I'm some professional expertise I'm sure in, in actually crafting the language would be important to us that if we uh, came up you know if we came up with the sort of uses we would like to see prevail in an RFP and then submitted them to you for your uh, word crafting into a statement that said, you know, this would give you, this would include all of these things and give you the maximum flexibility in the decision making process to decide amongst the different ones without boxing yourself in with specific uses that have to be checked off. Would that seem a reasonable thing sure. for us Should to they do? Have so? to do that. Uh, and we probably could do the same thing, you know, with the with the question of preservation and you know, how strong you know, we want some, but how much do we want? So if we were to say, form a subcommittee that came up with use language and one that reviewed the restrictions so that we get together the next time we have something to, to actually talk about, it's, it's almost more subcommittee work than something we want to do with, with a body this size. Uh, get together and come up with the, the language both for, for the physical restrictions and for the use things we'd like to see. Before we meet again, I would, I would be down with that. But I, also, Joe, you had mentioned something about discussion with potential developers and helping you develop the RFP. Um, is that something that you would do, and just at least try to get a laundry list of what potential developers may be considering for the property, and then, um, or is it something that, for instance, the subject committees that the that the councilors were talking about developing here would be more appropriate for? It? My concern is. Potential developers participating in the development of an RFP might sound like you're bringing the deck, and I don't know if there are laws precluding that. Right, you have to maintain that level playing field, so you would have to not just take the advice of one developer. Uh, that would be suspect. Uh, but we do this all the time. We talk to vendors when we're going to buy something, a major piece of equipment. We'll have everybody in a room and say, okay, you know, here's what we think we need. What do you guys think? And they'll say, you know, it looks okay, or they'll say, oh, you really want this attachment for your snow plow or something like that. And, and everybody will go, yeah, that sounds like a good idea, and we add it to our specification. So in this case, usually it's the department head who would um, do the vendor research, um, see what people out there. I know Dave Pomerantz has already taken two uh, potential uh, buyers through the building yesterday. Um, getting some press out there so that people would know who to go to in the city. And it could be a subcommittee or this a whole committee or a staffer who does this. But uh, just letting people know where to go to discuss ideas would be very helpful. Well, to that point, Dave, I don't want to put more on your plate, but um, it, it, it seems
seems logical that you would be the the go-to person for folks uh, for making inquiries or have aspirations for the property. So that and just so there's one central point, the, the contact point. And I'd be happy to help too. Yeah, that'd be great. You know. yeah, I think the the fact that there are two potential bidders who might not even be in conflict actually, but that. Um, and, and there are stakeholders who are clearly interested in, in this. And so far, the bidders that I know, or the, I'm not going to call them bidders, they're not bidders yet, but the two potential, uh, the interests, uh, do not run in conflict, as far as I understand, with the, with the tenants expressed will in this letter. So, I mean, so far, things, the clouds seem to be forming in such a way that they're actually starting to look like we may have, well, I'm going to resort to a phrase that I hate, win-win situation possibly. <laughs> so, um, but it, yeah, so I want to know whatever we can do to facilitate those conversations so we get a clearer idea so that that as we develop the RFP that we're not, I'm more concerned about eliminating or creating an impossible situation for people who might be, you know, willing to invest the energy and time to try and conform to our end goals, which is to, to try and preserve this as a community resource. So, so What's your pleasure at it? Because it probably is, this is probably too big a body to do that sort of subcommittee work. Do you want to form subcommittees, the one to look at the building and one to look at the uses and make recommendations uh, to the staff to then professionally craft it so it doesn't box us in too much? Is it something you want me to try to do a chair with the staff and bring back from what we've heard already? Like, what, what is your pleasure? I think when you form subcommittees, it becomes, it can be tricky because those subcommittees are still, you know, you, they still will have to then figure out a way to host a meeting and have a meeting, and I think it just creates a whole other layer. So I, I think it's... And that's just the way the council usually does business. It's not, not always a body like this form of subcommittees. Yeah. But I, so that would just be my, I just think that mm -hmm. some of the, I mean, I think some of the issues are getting a bunch of ideas out on the table, so perhaps the you know, you as the chair could assemble things that people, if people want to send you suggestions or something, and you could assemble them into a list of, as long as people are, the key is to just send it to the chair, not have a discussion, yeah. not just send yeah. it, send ideas, or, you know, this is a use I think should be considered, and then you can assemble a whole list of them. Mm -hmm. um, no, I'm, I'm happy to do that, but again, we can't, deli we can't deliberate. Uh, council I agree with what the mayor is saying. Mm -hmm. I think it makes it easier, and I agree about the subcommittees. It's just going to linger around and linger around. Mm -hmm. And I like the idea of directly sending our thoughts to the chair. All right. Um, well, that's probably two cents with him. I think we can do it right here. I mean, we've got mm -hmm. plenty of minds here that can. So the, um, my biggest, the biggest thing that I have people complaining about not having in Florence is there's no, since Brooks left, there's no drugstore, there's no pharmacy. I mean, I get that on a daily basis, wanting scope. I mean, that's just something that's not in Florence now. And that doesn't mean that the Florence Grammar School is going to have a big CVS sign out front. So I'm, not, I'm not going there. But um, I'm sure people have got different reasons for different things, so. Yeah, either which way, I, I like the idea of all of us here at a meeting doing it, mm -hmm. because this is not the first time that I've been involved in this, and I think right. it can be done right on the floor. So if everyone, and, and what I might, can I, can I impose on the kindly folks in the mayor's office to be the, the location that these emails go to, rather than to me personally, keep, sure. Keep them. I, I, I don't know. I mean, it's uh, the question would be, who? How are we going to? I mean, then we're done. Then we're going to have to forward it to you. So mm -hmm. interesting. Um, no, either way, I'm happy to. I'm happy to have them sent directly to me, or if you want them sent, you know, if you want them sent to your office, so they're in a central location. Well, the question is, what is it that you're going to ask people to send? Um, mm -hmm. They're uh, basically your. Comments on, on the two items we've spoken about. One, the uses that you might like to see in the RFP. And then the second one, the physical characteristics you'd like to see preserved in the building, how restrictive should it be, how not restrictive should it be. And then what I'll do is get together with the staff 
prior to our next meeting. And it's much easier to discuss it if you have some sample language to talk about. So what we might try to do is craft both a physical and a use criteria for this and then distribute it to you before the meeting so that we have a basis to start discussion. Uh, just to, to start with something completely open-ended can be less productive than to have a framework to start to talk around on both those topics. Uh, and, and we'll see where that goes as a starting point. We can tweak it at this level and you know, work on it as a committee of the whole or your own. Well, can I add to that that, that actually um, stakeholders and aspiring stakeholders, you, they wrote down their best wishes, mm -hmm. Christmas lists, and sent them to David Palmer so that we would have a sense of what, um, and then David can forward it to us. I mean, so getting back to your, <laughs> now we've got a three-way yeah, well, yeah, 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 Getting was. back to your point, if, if the goal is to have, you know, has to put language forward that then can be assembled into an RFP, maybe it makes sense to send it to, you know, if people have an idea, like, yeah. I think we want to have aircraft, aviation, you know, maintenance, whatever the term you used before, no, send that to you, or rooftop garden or whatever, then maybe. Because otherwise, I mean, we're going to basically get it and send it to Joe for him to look at and say, yeah, this can't be an RFP or this is too specific or something. I, mean, I don't know. I'm not sure what you think about that. Sure. As the well, next I mean, iteration. The clearing house for these suggestions, and then we can meet, sure. and, and we'll come up with a with sample language that's more specific to your comments that we can work on as a committee rather than just starting from scratch. That seemed like a reasonable. So Joe, you could be the, the sure. clearing house for the comments, and and it's true that it don't have to be just from the committee. If some member of the public here wants to send in their email. Well, the reason I was making the distinction between the potential bidders and stakeholders versus the people who are going to be deciding, you know, the design criteria or the, the historic or the design restrictions. I, I'd like to get a sense, so this committee would have a better sense about what's what's potentially out there um, coming from one segment. And we would be commenting upon uh, the historic uh, restrictions if there will be if we decide on that at all. And then we'd have a better sense where there's confluence, find out mm -hmm. uh, from people who are interested in, in, in the public who don't get to vote on this, understand what it is that they would um, like to see and see if, if uh, as we craft the, the, the RFP that we have a better sense of we're going to be in a good position to get someone to be interested in making it. So mm -hmm. that's why I ask somewhat of a separation. Mm -hmm. When you talk about historic restriction, when you're talking about restrictions that might be less restrictive than this, but those aren't going to guarantee planning board approval mm -hmm. of alternate uses. And the bidder, it would kind of be up to the, the person crafting the bid to determine, are they happy just with the underlying zoning uses, or do they feel they need a use that's going to require them to go do business on a site plan review to get and it may, it may well be that we can uh, convince the planning board some of our logic as well with regards to the use, because I don't know if they're used to that or not, but you know, we could always. But will this preclude someone from, how could someone bid on something that would require future planning board approval? Because they can't bid until they know planning board um, I raised this question of Wayne. Um, he said the language that you have now was recently approved, exactly that same language. So he said bidders would have a high degree of confidence that they would approve it again. If we change it, make it weaker, then there is no such assurance. And I would want to wait until we had all the approvals before we issue the RFP. Uncertainty would be the, the enemy of, of bidding, as usual. But until we, until we get a handle for how different we want the restrictions to be, add that to our list of things to chat with Wayne in the meantime and say, hey, here's, here's why we're thinking this might be too restrictive. If we wanted to lower the restrictions to this level, what sort of reception would we right. get? We could go to the planning board and say, yeah. do does think? this 
seem okay and uh, you work with this. Yeah. So if I may suggest for the agenda for the next meeting that we put surplus in the building on the agenda principally because I think this is actually in the interest of the existing tenants because the tenancy expires in uh, June mm -hmm. and that um, to, to dispel some of that uncertainty is to, to what we are looking forward to is because we clearly in the process we can't establish year leases after that because we're in the process of if we do surplus, and this is a presumption by the way. So, uh, and then also for another agenda item is the gathering of the information that, and for review and develop uh, at least a, a shell of an RFP. I, I would hope that if we can get everybody's comments in the next 10 days or so that we'd be able to have a starting point, a sample, a starting point that we collect from all the comments that we could then have a document in front of us to edit or, or work on rather than starting from scratch. Is that, okay. how, how cumbersome is this um, lease? Is it just a renewal of existing leases? There's no more work that has to be about if it gets to a point where we're into June. No, the, the leases have been the same for years and years. So it's basically just determining the rent for the coming fiscal year and then the same as that. Simple renewal. You're saying renewal, but I think what you're suggesting is would we want to do a one-year renewal or would you want to do a month-to-month -month after month a certain point? Right. Because otherwise you'd be selling the building right. with one-year leases attached to it. If that's, if that's yeah. another limitation. Yeah. But it would be my experience, though, that if you sold a building such as that, uh, by the time you put an RFP together and you put it together and you sell it, then there's going to be, there's engineering, there's going to be design work all kind of, mm -hmm. it'll be a year. Mm -hmm. But that would, leave, that would leave the issue of tenancy up to the new yeah. owner when they purchase it. Well, that's what that, that's they should negotiate that right. that's if, what they're, if they're not going um, to. And, there's, and it wouldn't necessarily be a year because there's a lot of use now that, that someone can immediately move in. Bada boom, bada bing. Yeah. I mean, if they, it, 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 so, I mean, I, yeah, I don't, I, I don't think, I don't think we can anticipate necessarily that it would be a year. So uh, if, if Mr. Cook is agreeing to be the collection point for for these comments for us to get started, do you want to just give us your email address? Jay Cook. Uh, uh, J. Cook, C O O K, at NorthamptonMA.gov. Everybody. And uh, by next a week from Friday, it would ten be days? reasonable, and then we have we'll have time to meet, and if we have to meet with Mr. Fye, then time to put some language together, which. We would then be able to share with you when we post our next meeting, so you'd be able to look it over ahead of time and start writing on it. Coming up with and suggestions. Is it uh, is it strictly a restriction that we're uh, sending, or general comments would, about I, the process? I would say it, could, it should be comments about use, comments about physical restrictions for preservation, yes. and then any general comments you want might want to make as well, okay. um, so that we can well and, and uh, have a document for you to deal with. As a, as a place to start when we meet. When we did meet you again. have, but did you, I think, Tom, did you have procedural questions or just, just sort of process questions or? No, he, he answered okay. what I, yeah. yeah. Um, so any other unanticipated business? I think we've got a good direction from everybody tonight and where we go from here. Any, anything anticipated? I have a question. Mm -hmm. Sure. Um, Bill is familiar with a couple of uh, parties that toured the building yesterday. Is that information we could all hear? Yeah. This, I, uh, uh, and Dan Ford and, uh, and Penny Burke are both work. Uh, Penny representing North Star, Penny representing the Arts Trust, and, and Vice Hensman Center for the Arts um, have, have expressed an interest in the prospect of this. And in, in fact, both of what they've described They spoke with some of the tenants as well. I think Ken's first foray was in the middle of the epic blizzard, so I don't know how many people were sitting up there at the time. But, but that, and you can introduce yourselves when you're when you're, when you're great. So our hearing no other unanticipated business. Our next meeting would be the fourth. Yeah, next month, the fourth Tuesday of. 
May 6th. Does it land? Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. at, uh, at 5 o'clock. So if there's no other business, any motion to adjourn? I so move. Yeah. Second. Second. Okay. All right. Thank you all. Hey. That's right. Coming. <laughs> <laughs> I, I know I've got a meeting.